for the short term. We're going to move away from the study of functions on the real line and move towards the study of sequences and series. So we start with a definition. A sequence is going to be an ordered and labeled list of numbers. The labeling is usually going to be by the positive integers, could be the non-negative integers, but it's always going to be some continuous string of integers. Now, when we define sequences, I mean, this can be any list of numbers, but usually we're going to find them defined in the following two ways. One way will be as a function of n. So here, n will be an integer, and I just say a sub n equals n squared, for example. And then the way I read this off is a1 is 1, a2 is 4, a3 is 9, and so on and so on. So the n squared is going to tell me how to get the value of the sequence just by looking at the index. Another way to define sequences will have recursively defined sequences. So here, I would start off with some initial values, say a0 equals 0, a1 is equal to 1, and then we're going to have a rule that tells us how to create the next element in the sequence from the ones before it. So in this case, our rule says to get the next one in the sequence, add together the two before it. As an example, the famous one is the Fibonacci sequence. What do we do? We start with our 0 and 1, and the rule is add the 2 before it. So second element of the sequence will be 0 plus 1 is 1. Next one will be 1 plus 1 is 2. 1 plus 2 is 3. So on and so on. Now it actually turns out the Fibonacci sequence can be defined by a function like we see in 1. But that's a little bit beyond the scope of what we're doing here. OK. So we have a definition for sequences. Well, there's a lot of things we could do with them. The first thing we're going to be interested in is a notion of convergence and divergence. This is the business of limits that we do with functions, only now applied to our new context. So the idea is going to be, as I let n go out to infinity, that's our index, can we predict where our sequence is heading towards? So it's going to be this business with limits and prediction. Let's take a look at two pictures. So I'm going to use it as an example, a sub n equal to 1 over n. Let's take a look. One way I can visualize this, instead of having an x-axis, I replace it with an n-axis, and I'll just think of the values of the sequence as being y values. So for 1 over n, I'll have put 1 in, I get 1, put 2 in, I get a half, a third, a quarter. And we see that as we keep going out, this thing's going to get driven down to 0. Another way to think of this, we'll have an interval picture. The idea is going to be, I'm going to take the y values for each of these. So the idea would be, we're just going to take the points and project them to the y-axis. That's going to mark off points. And you can think of this as being a1, a2, a3. And it'll be a little bit clearer if I put things on its side. So here you notice, as we go from A1 to A2 to A3, A4, this thing's going to keep moving closer and closer and closer to zero, but never actually hit it. So the idea is, we're going to have this notion of a limit for sequences. It's going to be the analog of the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x. For a formal definition of a limit, we're going to have the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n is equal to L. And then we have our Greek. For all epsilon bigger than 0, there exists an m bigger than 0, such that if n is bigger than or equal to m, then absolute value of a sub n minus L is less than epsilon. So for the most part, probably meaningless to most people, but that's how a mathematician precisely defines this notion of closeness. So that's what limits are about. We want to know. Are these points getting close to a certain number on mass? So what's the game we're playing? You're going to give me a small number epsilon. What I have to do, I have to tell you an m such that for all a sub n with their labels n bigger than m, we're going to have to have that these a sub n's are trapped in the interval l minus epsilon, l plus epsilon. Okay, how do we unspool that from this? Well, if I have a sub n minus l is less than epsilon, that's the same as saying that the thing in here, 
is between minus epsilon and epsilon. I'm going to add L to each term. That gives me L minus epsilon less than A sub N, less than L plus epsilon. And then that's just saying that AN is in the interval L minus epsilon, L plus epsilon. So the picture is, once I give you that M, we have this interval here like this, and then all the bigger labels, A sub N, are going to be trapped in my interval. We can have a few guys sitting outside of it, but once you give me that epsilon and I give you the M, we have to have everybody bunched around L. Okay, so that's the notion of closeness. Now, if no such L exists, we're going to say that A sub N diverges. Okay, for finding limits, we have one really big trick, which is just going to be fit your sequence to a function and then see what happens. So what I can do is I'll replace n with x, a sub n with f of x. And so the idea here is I want to fit a sub n to f of x. So let's look at our picture. Before the picture I had with n replacing my x-axis looked like this for a sub n equal to 1 over n. If I go to the function 1 over x, it's going to look like this. So we notice I have my sequence but there's a function that just falls right on top of it. What this is going to mean is all the techniques for f of x when I go out to infinity in x are going to apply to getting the limit. So the idea is going to be if I can find the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x, then that's great. That's going to be equal to what I had for the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n. Try the example limit n goes to infinity of n e to the minus n. So I'll fit this to the function x e to the minus x. That's a perfectly reasonable function. And then we can try to evaluate that as x goes to infinity. So what's going to happen here? We're going to have x is going to go to infinity. e to the minus x is going to go to 0. OK, just recall, how do I get the graph of e to the minus x? We plot three points at 1, 0, and minus 1. At 1, we're going to get a 1 over e, which is about a third. So that's down here. At 0, we're going to get 1. So that's going to be that point on the y-axis. And then at minus 1, we're going to get e, which is roughly 2.7. So back here, that's going to be a point up there. We have a horizontal asymptote at 0. I connect the dots. And we see as we go out to infinity, this is getting driven down to 0. Okay, pretty much by definition of a horizontal asymptote. So, Lehopital's rule applies. This is an indeterminate form of 0 times infinity. So what I'm going to do is move the e to the x to the bottom, just take away the minus sign, and then when we'll I do the limit, we're looking at something of the form infinite over infinite. Lehopital's rule now applies. I could take derivative of the top, derivative of the bottom, so it gives me 1 over e to the x. Derivative of e to the x is e to the x. Now when I do the limit, we're back to limit as x goes to infinity of e to the minus x. We just saw that that's 0. So that's going to mean the answer to the original problem is 0. So that's how I use this interchange from sequences to functions. OK, the only catch is not always the nicest thing when it comes to functions we haven't seen before. So for instance, if I use a sub n equal to minus 1 to the n, well, if you put an x up in there, that's not really sensible. We don't know how to do that. So in this case, you wouldn't want to really try to fit to a function. What you could do here is plot out the first few values. So if I put a 1 in, I get a minus 1. A 2 gives me a 1. 3 gives me a minus 1. Okay, so the idea is the odds will give me minuses. The evens will give me 1s. And so let's see what the picture is doing. Well, we're going to just bounce back and forth between minus 1 and 1. So if you think back to our definition of limit, if you slap an interval around minus 1, say, call that something of length epsilon on each side, well, can we trap all the future values if we lock it down on some m? Well, no, because we're going to have, no matter where you take your n in the sequence, it's always going to keep bouncing in and out of the interval that you pick no matter what interval you pick around minus 1. So there's no way this thing can converge to either minus 1, and then we could slap an interval around 1, and we'll see the same thing. So this guy is going to diverge. All right. 
Okay, we have more theorems we could pull from what we know about functions. We have our squeeze theorem for functions. We're now going to have it for sequences. So the idea is, if the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n, and the limit for b sub n are equal to l, if I have a c sub n, which is always between a sub n and b sub n, then the limit of c sub n is also going to be equal to l. So let's see how we can make this work. All right, so let's try to sequence c sub n equal to sine n over n. So here's the trick. We know sine is always between minus 1 and 1. If I divide everything through by n, we're going to have minus 1 over n, 1 over n, and in the middle, sine of n over n. Minus 1 over n is going to go to 0 as we go to infinity. 1 over n is going to go to 0 as we go to infinity. So our sine of n over n is also going to have to wind up going to 0 as we go out to infinity. Now, I could graph this to give you an idea of what's happening. But what's lousy about this is that we're not looking at sine of n pi here. We're looking at sine of an integer. And off the top of my head, I don't know how to get those. That would be something I'd need to go to a calculator for. So in this case, the squeeze theorem is actually really saving us a lot of grief because it's letting us just get rid of this sine n on the top as soon as we can.